Welcome Wait. back to another episode of Living Lifted with Branson Ross. I got my man here today, Cameron Hatch, but he goes by Cam. I'll call him Cam today. Sure. Cam, got a lot of things going on, but I just put a little intro, and if you want to add anything to, take anything away, sure. go for it. I just say Cam is an athlete, coach, and you're an entrepreneur as the developer of what he calls the program. But before we even talk about the program or any of that kind of stuff, I want to talk about Cam. I want people to get to know Cam a little bit. Okay. So has sports been a big part of your life, your whole life? What was your childhood like? Is that just kind of like who Cam has always been? Is that you knew you wanted to play sports or what was that like? Yeah. So I always wanted to be a pro athlete growing up. I think you can really resonate with that because <laughs> yeah, that's all I did. Except one of us actually did more with that. <laughs> so. Yeah. But, um, but I played, I played soccer growing up. I played hockey and I played baseball. Okay. I uh, played soccer till I was like nine. And then I cut that off real quick. And then I played ice hockey. I've been skating since I was like two years old. Okay. So I where'd you grow up? Where are you from again? I'm from Connecticut. So they so, had a yeah, lot of that. I was ice born in New Mexico. So I was born in New Mexico. I didn't know that. Yeah, I was born in New Mexico. And then my dad got an opportunity to go to grad school. He's working at Johnson & Johnson. Okay. And then he got an opportunity to go to grad Slinging school in Boston. Slinging that baby powder, huh? That's right, baby. <laughs> and so um, he actually ended up going to MIT. And so, uh, yeah, he was one of those guys that really inspired me from a young age, just knowing that because uh -huh. not everybody gets to go to an opportunity like that. Right. Right. But he just did it through like brute willpower wow. of just like i want to get to higher levels were you able to recognize that as a kid you could yeah, see oh yeah 100 percent. like sick. probably right around like 12 13 years old i recognize that like okay not everybody's dad is going to mit west point <laughs> that kind of thing yeah. so um just from a young age i was i was instilled with um you know high value uh, work ethic and whatnot mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then also just constantly trying to progress and push myself to higher and higher limits cool. um so that's what led me to professional sports mm -hmm. but so you, know, you saw what he was doing and you're like all right my lane to deploy that type of work ethic is into sports yes like you just knew that as yes 100 percent and did you know which sport yet? Or you just knew it was one of them? So I, I always went back and forth. I always wanted to go to higher levels of hockey and then it was baseball. But basically it became more and more clear in high school that I was gonna go for baseball mm. because at the end of my junior year, uh, I had like 15, 20 offers for baseball. And then I had like zero for, for hockey. So it, it'll make your decision. Yeah, for it you. made my decision for me. And I was left handed. I was a pitcher. Okay. And so it just made it really, really clear as to what I was going to go through uh -huh. as far as, you know, what sport I was going to be a hitter, too. Um, so I was up until high school and I was actually really good, but I was right handed hitter and I was a lefty thrower. And so like, if you think about baseball, right, if I'm a righty hitter, my left elbow is hanging out over the plate. And so when I, when I got there, uh, my freshman year of high school, my coach was just like, yeah, no, we're, we're we have an that. asset just ready to right. get hit. And yeah. Okay, right. So sense. he took the bat out of my hands real quick. So I ended up playing varsity baseball as a ninth grader. Wow. Yeah. My first outing in freshman baseball, I had no hits against me for like four innings and they just took me out. I had a perfect game actually going. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I didn't and then know they, this. yeah. And then they started me at JV the very next game. I okay. pitched one game in JV and then they're like, yeah, yeah, you're going to be on varsity. And I was a second starter as a freshman. How fast year. were you throwing then? I was probably throwing like 70, 82 miles an hour. Just had good feel for mm -hmm. pitch. And you're working different. Angle yeah. I, play, could just, different, different I could just soft. spin a curveball, got a good change up, got a fastball. So yeah, mm -hmm. that was sorry it. if you guys can hear that again the helicopter we have a military huey landing outside next to us right now and that's why it's so loud um so you saw what your dad was doing you deploy that into your work ethic what do you think as far as like actual valuable life lessons that you were learning during that process too as part of sports because i do believe that I don't think it's good to like force your kid into a box as far as like, you need to play this sport. I think pushing them lovingly and sure. having the right kind of conversations, like, hey, I see this talent in you. I would encourage you to explore this. Yeah. And not only that, I'm actually gonna be behind you and support you in this journey. I think that's a, a great way of doing it. Um, 
sports are such a good thing to teach people accountability, to work with others, self-discipline, all those things. So how did that kind of shape you at, during those formidable years of when you're stepping into becoming a man? That part was, was challenging for me. And I think it was challenging for you. I think that's why we resonate so well together mm. is it got to such an extreme level of me wanting to pursue whatever I was going to pursue almost wholeheartedly mm. right to the to the point where i would go to any kind of lengths to be able to make it to whatever level that i wanted to mm. that that meant that meant trying to outwork basically everybody and try to earn it as best i could mm -hmm. and that's just the way that i looked at things it was such an extreme view that no one really truly understood like my pursuit what age what do you think that even started dude that started probably at like 16 17 years old wow yeah See, i appreciate the compliment but actually i wasn't like that yet really? not at that point okay um I had the talent, but I didn't have that side of it. Okay. I still wanted to be comfortable. Right. I would choose being comfortable over doing the hard work at yeah. that time. And it wasn't until actually I got out of my childhood home and my brother passed away and okay. some other things in life happened that pushed me into that mode Yeah. where that then was like, I needed to find my sense of security, my identity. And then right. that's really when I stepped into being that way. Right. And I really, I really wasn't that way really? at that age. No, that you were, you were me. ahead of me. Yeah. Okay. You, you were that way much earlier than I was. Yeah. Yeah. That's what type of level it brought me to. I used to, dude, I used to before like hockey seasons and whatnot, cause hockey was my big thing growing up. Mm -hmm. That's really what I wanted to, to be was a hockey player. And I used to I used to tape my goals up on the wall. Now, when I started out with goal setting, I didn't know how to do it, mm -hmm. right? So I used to do it totally based on results. Like I just wanted the result. So what I put up in my wall was how many how many goals I wanted to score, how many points I wanted, and then the awards that I wanted after the season. Mm -hmm. And so I used to just sit there on my bed, imagining myself achieving all of those things. And I used to have and write down, I write out this routine of what, how, how much I was going to. So you were run. doing like manifestation practices. Pretty much, at that age. Yeah, yeah. When I when I was a kid, I didn't wow. know like anything else. My junior year of high school, my first junior year, because I repeated my junior year, I went to prep school. Okay. But my first junior year, I was at um, just a Catholic school or whatever, and I would again, I would tape those goals up on my wall. And then um, that's when I won uh, State Player of the Year for Connecticut. That's when I got as many goals as I wanted. That's when I had six hat tricks out of the 18 games that I ended up playing. Wow. Like that, that's really and truly like where I first got goal setting in my mind of what I wanted to do and how I wanted to do it. So even doing that yeah. for hockey, you still weren't getting looks or offers? How no, no, because hockey is different. So first and foremost, the, the public school league that I was playing in, no one goes to college out of that. Okay. Not typically. Right? Okay. I got a young guy I'm working with in soccer, and he's been explaining to me how that's kind of works for him now too. Right. So it's probably it's a similar. little. It's a little different. Okay. I would assume for soccer, high school isn't really it. it you have yeah, to go to he's, club. Yeah. He's he's 13, right. and yeah. he's already in one of the MLS clubs system, basically. Yeah. 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 At 13 years yep. old. Yeah. Yep. It starts young in soccer and hockey too. Okay. When I went to prep school, that was a that was like two or three steps up as far mm. as games go. Okay. And my second junior year, that's where I learned that the goals that I was setting have to be more uh, process based than result based. Oh. Because when I got to that school, I tried to do the same thing: post my goals, um, results that I wanted, all that stuff. And what ended up happening was probably one of the worst things and one of the best things during my formative years happened because now I was not first line. I wasn't the best player on the team. Now I was on the third line. I wasn't really thought about. I wasn't a major player on the team. Okay. And that really messed with my mental sure. and my identity too, sure. because that wrestles with you. It's like, yeah. Oh, I'm the alpha. Like yeah. I'm this, I'm that, yeah. like I'm the goal scorer. And, and that's the first time that I wasn't and I didn't feel seen. And all of a sudden now I couldn't, you know, talk and communicate with my, my teammates and really understand understand like who I was because what gave you confidence before yes. was the fact that you were the star exactly and then it gave you the ability to communicate and yep. then when that was taken away from you you're like what do I have to stand on why do I deserve to be exactly heard? 
Yeah. Mm. So that's where I first recognized where my identity was wrapped up in my performance. And that's how I was raised in my home was it yeah. was all about performance base. What age is this now? You're junior? This is probably 17 years old. You were realizing that your identity was in performance at that age? 100%. Wow. Absolutely. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. And I, I, I realized like how my social anxiety kind of worked as okay. far as like if I didn't earn the way and the right to be able to speak because yeah. my performance wasn't there and it was just it was a whole mess and i was like i don't even know how to get out of this i recognize that this is a cycle but i don't oh. know where to even start wow yeah now at the same time you're still playing baseball yeah so did it push you because now that you're not the man in hockey that it's like well i still have this over here that these guys don't have and maybe i need to go more invest more here yeah uh. so um that's a that's a great point so after that second junior year at the prep school okay. where I went up a, a couple levels in hockey, it came to baseball season. And the way that I got like my ability to relate to people back was that I was his left-handed pitcher. I was one of the best on the team. I was one of the best in the region, all that stuff. And I had this awesome game against um, our rival school. And so everybody like remembered that game because it was really, really cold out or whatever. And it was a bases loaded scenario, no outs because one of the pitchers before like walked everybody on. And then I ended up striking three people out. And everybody's just like, who is this guy like, all of a sudden? And so like a rumor went around school of like what kind of pitcher that I was. The, the opposing um, team called me, His the head coach called me and his dad was an agent for, the, for one of the MLB or uh, for a bunch of MLB guys and so he calls me and he's like we want to we want to like we want to make sure that you're on these lists and all this yeah. stuff and we want to make sure you're at these events this summer and so that's where I kind of got my mojo back in a sense of like who I was oh that phone call to give you so much yeah absolutely talk dirty to me man like, so good yeah. absolutely <laughs> so you start to get looks yeah right and then what does that kind of trajectory start to look like from that point that was my second junior year summer so that's the summer that I kind of went off as far as like the offers that I was getting mm -hmm. So I probably got, I probably got 15 to 20 offers there. Okay. Um, I had probably, probably had like six to eight, you know, D one schools offer me 60% or more and like weekend spot, um, you know, as a freshman, that kind wow. of thing. So that's what I was getting offered. Um, and so that made my decision really, really fast as sure. far as like what sport I was going to ultimately play. And during that summer too, I had gotten offers to play on top level, you know, travel ball teams, you know, whatever, travel this, travel that. Did you consider that? And I did. Okay. I did consider that because I felt like that would open the door for me uh -huh. as far as like where I could go with the sport. So now knowing what you know yeah. with what you do, and yeah. I don't want to get into that yet, for but sure. I just want to ask this question. Yeah. You take yourself back into that spot. Yeah. Do you take the same trajectory? Same trajectory. Good. Yeah. That has to feel good. No, absolutely. 100%. Because I played with everybody that I grew up playing with. I have it tatted on my arm. It's this R right here. Okay. Yeah. So love that's it. that's my Rockville Legion team that I that's grew up sick. playing with. I love with. it. And so I love playing with that team. The reason being is because I knew I wouldn't have been in that spot if... I hadn't met those people before. If I hadn't played Little League with those guys, you know, and they hadn't motivated me to ultimately become the pitcher and the person uh -huh. that I was at that time, uh -huh. I never would have been playing. It's like so, Braun and that his St. Vincent team. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Like he like Braun could have gone anywhere, but he's like, nah, I'm rocking mm. with St. Vincent, St. Mary. Like, mm -hmm. let's do it. These are my guys. It's the same thing with my Rockville Legion team. They're loyal dude. Yeah, I love absolutely. that. I've seen that since the first time I met. <laughs> For you. sure. Okay. So you start to get those offers, you step into playing that team and then what? Yeah, so I had and the great, social anxiety has all kind of been on the shelf because you're rocking. Sure. You're oh doing yeah, good. You're no, feeling we're good. Okay, absolutely. Okay. So um, during that summer, um, you know, I I basically go off as far as like my performance and whatnot. Um, I get fifteen to twenty offers or whatever, and I commit to the University of Maryland. Um, at the end of that summer so i went on all these visits i, I saw as many schools as i could that and that's so what i ended up yeah that's what oh, i ended up committing so but i made a mistake okay. i made a mistake during that time so like i said i had six to eight opportunities to go to mid-major schools some good schools and they offered me 
you know, a bunch of financial investment, <laughs> like sixty uh percent -huh. or more, uh -huh. right? And uh, I end up choosing the University of Maryland because it was in the ACC at the time, and they didn't offer me any scholarship. They offered me a walk in, walk on, recruited spot, and I ended up taking that instead of all the other offers. Why? Because uh, I had a cousin at the time that was living at in in Maryland. My mom fell for the pitch of dude they on my recruitment visit they handed me a sheet of it said my name across the top it said top 10 reasons why cam Hatch should attend the university of maryland and my mom was like all up in arms about that she was like oh my god this is crazy and then it listed off as to why i should go to that school mm. and then i also asked the coach i'm like hey how many left-handed pitchers are coming in this class he said oh we're not recruiting anybody okay right and so and so i ended up i ended up committing to the university of maryland when i should have gone to to all these other schools that mm -hmm. offered me way more money were way more interested but i just didn't understand how the college process worked um, but it was mainly my my mom who is like all sold on wanting to go and obviously an acc school mm -hmm. which acc is like one of the best baseball conferences that you can possibly imagine once I heard all that, I was just all right. I'm I'm sold. Mm. And it, dude. There's also a there's also a complex too, egotistically, of like, if I can tell my friends I'm going to an ACC school, like they're gonna think I'm the man, mm. right? As opposed to like if I commit to University of Rhode Island or um, Binghamton up in New York, which is they're great programs, mm -hmm. but there's just a different kind of level when you tell them you're going to ACC versus those. those On levels. that thought trajectory yeah, that you sure. just identified. Yeah. At that time, did you believe you had the ability to not only excel in college, but to then go to the next level? The reason why I asked that yeah. question is if you didn't, then going to an AC school and hanging your hat on that and being able to brag about it, like, okay, look what I did, but this is probably going to be the extent of it. Right. Or if you really had that confidence in yourself that I know I can go to that next level, then I'm going to go to any of these schools. They're For lucky sure. to have me. Yeah. Right. There's some arrogance in there, right. but it is what it is. Right. And I'm going, this is just a stepping stone to where I'm going. Where was your head at there? My head was at like, it wouldn't have mattered where I went. Mm. I was going to outwork anybody and everybody to make that happen for me. Okay. And regardless of if that's true or not, that's just what I wholeheartedly believe at that time. Absolutely. It, it wouldn't have mattered. It come hell or high water. It does not matter. Like mm -hmm. I'm going to bet against myself and, and mm -hmm. push myself to the next level. I just made a, a mental connection that I can't wait to ask you about here okay. in a minute, but I'm not going to do it. Yet. All right. Um, so you take that offer, you start playing there. Yeah. Then you're obviously the goal is to try to get to the league. So what does that look like? Yeah. So, um, the junior summer that I had ended up being a lot of wear and tear on my arm. Um, and I wasn't throwing right based on what I know. Did now. they try to change you at all that could have caused that? Or that was just on no, you? you no, on no, no, I never, I never made it there. So oh. come junior summer, I'm, I'm good leading up to senior year. I'm good. Um, <clears throat> I had gone through my throwing program and whatever. And even at hockey practice, like I noticed that my left arm was like just super tight when I was like shooting or whatever. I didn't really think anything of it because I never had arm issues. Oh. And um, so I'm in like the third or fourth game of my high school, my senior year. And again, we're facing our rival school. Like it's a, it's a big, big game. There's going to be scouts there, the whole okay, thing. Okay. I'm following you now. You're talking about yeah. senior high school. So you, senior when you said high school. got there, you're not even throwing I'm from not, Maryland yet. Yeah. I'm not even throwing I see. Okay. I'm got you. So now yeah, I got to my senior year of, of high school. Yeah. And again, like it's a big game. There's a lot of, you know, hype around this game. It's probably the best game in Connecticut, um, to that point. And I'm throwing in there. I'm throwing a, a shutout and we get to the sixth inning and then all of a sudden I feel like this this icy hot sensation on my elbow and it won't mm. go away and every each and every pitch that uh, I have it keeps burning more and more uh, and more and I'm like man like why will this not go away uh, and then I start walking a guy and then the very next pitch I spike one at 50 feet and I hear a pop and, I, and at that time I knew like I was like all right like I I just I just popped my UCL like I, I knew <laughs> what, what went through your head at that time. It was just more of shock. It was just like, I don't, I don't really know what to do. Um, when did it set in that how much it could potentially affect the trajectory of everything you were? Yeah. Not, not until I actually got the surgery 
not until I actually got the surgery where it was just like, wow, we're we're really here. This is really like real. I'm talking like basic stuff, like yeah. being able to like shower. Yeah. Being able to just like do day to day things. All all the identity had been lost. Like I couldn't no longer could I try to outwork anybody. I had to like sit in my own feelings, sit in my own thoughts. I'm like, this is like, and the social terrible. anxiety came right back off oh, that shelf. Right back, hit you real right. quick. Yeah, buddy. <laughs> real quick. Yeah. Yep. So I go to University of Maryland. I am a social basket case. Like, I do not know what to do. I'm injured. I, no one knows me. Like, mm. how am I going to perform? I, the only thing that I can do is just try to like show that I at least work hard, mm. and that was it. And did you have Literally that goal it. of? Cause you had the work ethic obviously right. that had been in you for a long time right but now i'm gonna come back like what were they telling you that yes if you put in the work you can fully recover from this or right. what did that what did that look like yeah so i get to campus and um they had recruited more than one left-handed pitcher of course they did. <laughs> there was like three of them yeah. and they were all better than me <laughs> and uh they had all given them scholarships and whatnot when i get back there i'm like i'm still in the mindset of okay during this rehab process i'll at least be able to outwork everybody and be able to get back there and so um during that time, I'm still researching methods and ways to train and ways to, to ultimately get back and what does that kind of look like and whatever. And by the, by the time the spring hits and I'm back throwing um, off the mound, I'm dude, I'm throwing like 75 miles an hour, <laughs> like so low 80s. Behind where you were in high school. Not, kid, yeah, it was terrible. Freshman year. Yep. And do you have their system behind you helping you in this or you're facing this solo? No, I'm, I'm basically facing this solo, but not because they weren't willing to help, but because like I thought that my research, my methodology is going to be better than what they have for me. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know why it's just like it's the stubbornness in me mm -hmm. it's the stubbornness in me I you might just, be paying off right now we'll get to that point. yeah but that started in you at that absolutely that point. interesting yep. yep and you have your locked your sights locked in on i'm coming back okay 100 and when you got do you feel like you got to at least where you were before if not surpassing that or do you feel like that injury actually kept you from ever being back to that same level again yeah so definitely not at the university of maryland okay. um i never i never got back there to where i was and it's really hard whenever a guy experiences uh an injury a major injury at a lower level than mm. where they're playing now like let's say you're going from high school to this level or you're going from double a all of a sudden you re you have to rehab and try to still make it to the majors but you've never been to the majors or you've never been to that college level right as somebody who's never done it before it's really really hard to surpass not only where you were physically but then also mentally be like, I am on that level to mm -hmm. be able to get to that level. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's almost like muscle memory, but like experience memory to an right, extent. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Because, because think about it. Like I've it's never, familiar. I've never pitched an ACC game with mm -hmm. thousands upon thousands of fans. Right. Like one of my first outings in the ACC is at UNC on a Friday night. There's, you know, 5,000 people, 7,000 people in the stands, whatever the capacity is at that stadium. And I'm, I'm jogging in and I'm facing a major league hitter and I, the first pitch is just like at his head because I'm just like so flustered. Sure. Like I don't know I don't know what that's like, mm. right? And so it's like it's one thing if you get injured at the University of Maryland and you've pitched there before for a few years or whatever, you know what to expect when you get back into a game. But if you're a high schooler and you've never been to the ACC and you've never been through that Friday night experience, you have no idea what you're getting into. Yeah. And so it's totally different when you have a major injury trying to hop levels. It's just really really hard. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So what does the rest of that trajectory look like? What's that? Where's that story pivot to where we are now? Yeah, I ended up transferring to a division two in, in Austin, Texas. Um, and at that point, that's where I kind of got it back to a certain extent. Um, I started throwing a little bit harder. My, my arms started feeling a little bit better. The first year after that, 
season, like the summer after that season, I go to one of the best summer leagues in the country mm. and I end up being um, the best closer in that league. Really? Yeah, I was a top 10 prospect in that league. There's some guys that are still in the major leagues that are on that top 10 prospect list sure. um, that I was on as well. Um, but but I end up being a top 10 prospect and whatnot, whatever. Uh, when I came back that fall, I get in for my first fall game and there's 20 scouts behind home plate. And I'm like, who are they here for? And they're like, they're here to watch you. Like there were dudes like in the no bullpen. Kidding. Yeah, I swear to God. Oh, that rush. Had yeah. Oh yeah. It was, it was crazy. I'm getting hit. I am dope right now. Right. But Come um, on. I'll tell you a little bit about like what happened as well, okay. because I was warming up and there were scouts asking me questions as I was warming up filming me as I'm warming up this experience I've never had before. And so I go into the game and, um, again, like as I'm warming up, dude, there's literally like 20 guns and they have cameras filming me to look at how I'm throwing and whatnot. Never had anything like that before. But all the meanwhile, during that summer, I was doing a ton of nefarious activities. I was mm. drinking, mm. doing a bunch of drugs, all sorts of things, man. Just yeah. trying to like find myself. Right? Yeah. And um, find yourself, escape yourself, escape all the, all the above, all the above, yeah. man. <laughs> so, um, so as I'm going through that process, um, I get back to campus uh, that fall, and now all of a sudden, now because I can't do any of those things. Now I don't feel like myself, mm. right? And so um, mm. I'm just partying a bunch. I'm not taking care of myself. And so when I went into that game, I was not the same as I was during the summer. And so all of a sudden now 20 scouts turns to five scouts, turns to two scouts, turns to no scouts really fast. And that was a cold, dark reality as to um, – just where I where I ended up being in a in a low low dark spot, and so um, at that you know, point, were you able to accept that responsibility, or did you try to pass that blame? No, I, I accepted. I knew. I knew. Yeah, I've always I've I've always been um, an accountability first guy for sure. Like I know it's always on me. That was the majority of my college experience. Um, I did have some some pro experience. I did. End up playing for four years, traveling across the country, playing independent professional baseball. Never got affiliated time with anybody. My journey was basically couch surfing for four or five years, not making any money playing baseball, but just trying to find that person that I was in that 2014 summer over again mm. and just never being able to fully recaptivate what that magic was. I didn't know if it was substances, training, whatever, right? So that led me down a rabbit hole of trying to chase what that person was. And there's a lot of people that can relate with that. For sure. And it might not be in sports. It might be at a time that their business was killing. Right. Even just a time of life that they can look back and identify of they thought that they were very, they're happier than they've ever been. Right. Yes. And now they feel like they're not as happy as they were then. And they're trying to get back to that and chase that. Right. And you hear it all the time. It's stereotypical. What got you there and what got you here is not going to get you where you go next. Right. And I think it's very applicable in that scenario. But yet I think the next part of that reverse engineering process is if I was so happy, then what did I do leading up to that? And can I do that exact same thing again now to try to get me that same result? And oftentimes the case is no. No, right, exactly. And now you feel lost, yep. chasing your tail. Yep. It's tough. Exactly. It's tough. <laughs> it's very tough. So you saw the system leading into going to school and then wanting to go pro, playing in the league that you played in and even just down to the, the nitty gritty of when you were injured that you in your head thought you had a better road back than even they were going to provide for you. How does this lead now into what you're doing with the program, with your approach? Um, I want to talk actually specifically yeah. as much as you can with office without showing, but for you can sure. go with baseball in hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I think it's, and I've seen it firsthand, but I'm asking a loaded question. I think it's so much more than just the technique you're teaching. It's also the mental approach for sure as well. Right. But let's, I just, that was a huge question with a lot of facets to it, yeah. but 
from your own experience, mm -hmm. let's not even say Cam today sitting in this chair, but Cam, when he's starting out to do the program, and I know some of the backstory, we don't even have to get into the right. other locations and stuff, but even just from the mental approach of when you first started out to try to help other guys do what you're wanting to do, why? What was the what was the mental approach and what was what was your your core reasons as to why you then wanted it was it just a job was it that you wanted to right. take what you'd seen the brokenness in the system or the fallacies in the system that you felt you had identified whether they were right or wrong right and then try to help someone circumnavigate them what were you trying to do what was the purpose of it so it just started out as um a way to make money mm -hmm. to be able to keep supporting the dream of are you still playing pitcher yeah okay for make me to make me play okay right so i did that for three years where i'd run the business and then play half the year so that's how i started out okay and i would go back to st louis each and every year that's how i would do it and um you know really and truly during that time what i wanted to do is was show kids a better way in just the physical training aspect mm. Um, just to be able to, to push them to, to limits that they'd never seen before. Um, just to be able to get kids to believe in themselves. Right. Like that's really and truly like where training starts is it doesn't, my program doesn't do anything unless you wholeheartedly believe that it's actually going to do something. That's true in any training program. A lot of things, right? Like a lot of things. Like if you don't think that it's going to work, then chances are it's probably not going to work mm -hmm. right and so it was just a matter of trying Man, there's to a whole sermon in that right there for about, sure like i always heard the scripture that talks about being lukewarm yeah and honestly i thought i kind of tacked it up again as a performance thing where it's like god wants you to be all in yes. and not just like doing the yes. bare minimum but until i learned that it actually is not even for him it's for us Right. Because if you're lukewarm and you're straddling both lines of sort of having the faith and sort of committing your life and then being out of it, still living the way you used to, it just splits you at the seams and you're absolutely miserable in the process. But if you right. actually fully relinquish and fully step into what you believe yes. and trust him in all things, you actually can find peace. Yes. But you're better off either being on one side or just going completely the other way, right. but not being torn yep. in the middle. And that's by design. It wasn't like I need you to perform this way it was I, w I don't want you to be lukewarm because this is what the pain is going to produce in your yes. life and yep. it's for us yeah so, sorry go ahead oh no, that's that's there. great yeah <laughs> yeah um uh as far as as far as like the performance side that's that's what i wanted you know guys to to get to mm -hmm. now that took extreme lengths because um obviously when I did something like that, you're living pretty extreme and you're also living where you don't know where your next paycheck is going to come from. Okay. Right. So for the person that does not understand baseball whatsoever, yeah. you were taking a non-traditional approach at training. That, not yet. Oh, not, not yet. Not okay, yet. I'm getting no, ahead. No, no, okay. no. My name is Jacob McLaughlin, and I'm the founder of New to Medical Device Sales. Medical device sales is the selling of medical equipment to hospitals, surgeons. They're actually in the surgeries, and the average rep's going to make around $177,000. And what we've been able to do is help people break in about eight weeks at around $100,000 starting out in the industry. It usually is five to seven interviews, six to 12 weeks long in the interview process, and they go up against thousands of people. But that's because you are going to be working with some of the smartest human beings, such as surgeons. You're going to make over six figures. You get your car paid for, all your gas paid for, and all your travel paid for. We've been able to help over 2,000 people do this in the last two years. Not only do we help people break in to make a difference and change other people's lives, they also get to change their lives. If you're interested in helping people and you're interested in financially becoming free, we can definitely help you. And I think you should check out New to Medical Device Sales, our podcast, while you can also click the link where you guys can learn more about what we do at New to Medical Device Sales. I absolutely love Brenton. I thank him so much for what he's doing for all of you. And I hope you guys keep enjoying the episode. Okay. I was I was doing like industry standard stuff oh. during that time and I was getting great results. Like I it's not like I wasn't. Um but what ended up happening is I was only working with high school and college kids. Now when when you get past that, then you start to get really really it, things get a lot smaller, right? Because if you're working with a pro and you're trying to bring him from 89 90 to 
let's say 95 or you're trying to get somebody from 94 95 to 98 99 the the windows and the points in which you have to improve get smaller and smaller and smaller that makes and sense smaller. With the, the high technique school changes are smaller, very, very, okay. very, very small. You're talking sense. about you're talking about inches. You're, yeah. you're fighting for inches at this time. And so um, with the high school kids, like I understood how to do all that, get a strength base, you know, move a little bit better and then throw a little bit harder. Mm. Right. But I didn't start studying the actual throw itself at a much deeper level until probably like 2022. Like this well, is motivated like, that you just saw so, something there and you're curious what led to it oh no, so so dude i kept getting injured over and over and over again regardless of what i did on the training side right so during my whole process from the university of maryland to my pro days to whatever right i kept having elbow issues so i have i've had probably seven or eight mris on my elbow huh. and so Every time that I would get injured, it'd be like, all right, new training protocol, new training protocol, new training this, new training that. And I got to a certain point where I was like, dude, it's not the freaking training. <laughs> like it's gotta be how I'm throwing a baseball. Like it has to be. And so then I started to deep dive into what other guys were doing, the guys that were healthy and threw hard. Like what were the commonalities between those guys and what I'm doing? Of the actual mechanics of the, of the throw. The actual mechanical throw. Like you're, where is this doing. happening? I'm following you. Okay. Right? Okay. And there was a dude that I was rehabbing from, from Tommy John as well. That's the UCL replacement surgery of the elbow. It's basically the ACL of the elbow. And um, I was training him. And he was telling me about sensations that he's trying to create, things that he's trying to feel. Like, and I was like, why is he trying to feel this? Because this is opposite of everything that I've been thinking about. And why is he want it this way? And one of the one of the first aha moments for me was we were doing this silly, silly stretch of like trying to extend and trying to feel like a stretch back here. That's like the, the ball getting up to this point right here. And he was like, yeah, I want to feel like I'm throwing downward. And I was like, he wants to feel like he's throwing downward. Like, that doesn't make any sense. But this dude throws 100 miles an hour. And so I'm like, all right. Like, so obviously something's so working. So something's yeah. working. Yeah. <laughs> he's doing something right. Yeah. And so like I started to, to think about that in my head. And I started to reanalyze re every 100 mile an hour thrower that I was looking at. And I started to see like, okay, this is what that guy does. It's very similar to what this guy does. He does it in a different style, but it's almost exactly the same as what this other guy does. Mm. And so then I started to put together like different checkpoints of all of these guys that you. were That's in, that were throwing a hundred miles an hour. Yeah. I was like, this position's the same. This position's the same. This pop timing's the same. Th this angle's the same, like everything. And it all started to like click in me. And I was just like, oh my gosh, like what if we just did this with all the guys? Like they just started to understand how to throw downhill. They understand like where the ball needs to flip up. They understand how to rotate around these couple different points. What if we could do it just a little bit faster? Like that's where everything started to kind of like align and click for me was like the fall of 2022, where basically my entire business had been destroyed and I was trying to rebuild it. And it was just like, I was having like these aha moments because it was almost out of necessity. It was like, this either has to work or I have to go find a real job. And I really don't feel like finding <laughs> a real job. And so that's where, that's where the mechanical analysis, that's where I started to line up all these throwers. That's where I started to really understand like what they were trying to do. Okay. Yeah. So then once you establish like the congruencies of the mechanics yes. of those guys, yeah. Then what you do kind of reverse engineer back yes. to where the power comes from and then develop your training system based around yes. creating more explosiveness and power yes. from what's actually generating their mechanism. Exactly. Yes. Um, so the first and foremost thing that I always focus on with everybody is positioning first. Positioning's number one. You have to actually understand what positions that you need to get into. These are the things that are most commonly messed up as far as um, not only in the training, but also in the throwing as well. Okay. So the training is going to beat it in your head as to what positions you ultimately need to get into, right? So that's first and foremost. So the positions would be like the things that I always talk about. Like first, the, the hips need to match the slope of the mound. 
Second would be the shoulders have to match the slope of the mound. Third would be actually the ball trajectory, the line downward down the mound has to match as well. If we can get those three things to match, typically that's when we can get gravity on our side to be able to help us accelerate the ball for us. That's when you get the easiest throw of your life, the thing that kind of clicks in your head of like, I can do this forever, right? Like that's what you want. So to understand that, you have to reverse engineer and understand like, all right, to get my hips to be able to get there, I have to have control of my abs, the lower lat attachment, and the hip flexor. If I can get those to understand how to like keep my pelvis underneath uh, me uh-huh. as I'm trying to rotate as fast as I can down a ch- downward trajectory, now I can just snap that as fast as I possibly can. So where in the training do I need to work on that so I can actually get my body to move like it actually needs to move? Then the second layer of that is the actual timing of it. So once you understand the actual positions that you need to get into and you've beat it in your brain of like, these are the positions that I need to hit. This is everything that I need to do. Then you need to actually time it up correctly in space, right? So this is where you get into, all right, where's the ball flipping up? Am I, am I externally rotated when the ball, when my front foot lands or is the ball torqued up like I need it to be so I can just snap and rotate around it with the most amount of force and the most amount of distance and time that I can possibly fathom, right? Like that's where, that's where the timing starts to get um, layered back on. So I might understand positionally, okay, my hip is in the right spot. Um, my, my shoulders are down, my hips are down, all that stuff is there, but now the ball flip up is here and it needs to be here. Right? So understanding the positioning is first and then the timing is layered on second to where you can actually float in space to actually feel what you need to be able to do on time. There's a lot of similarities here to a golf swing. Yes, precisely. And as you were, I was listening to you talk and I know you're trying, you're taking talent sometimes having to break old habits, which is really hard. Yes. Someone that comes in that has talent, but doesn't have the old bad habits. Yep. That's so much easier. Same yes. thing for like with a golf swing. Yep. Someone's coming over the top all the time, breaking that habit to then come from the inside. It's yep. really hard for a lot of people. Um, but the way you explained it, it almost seemed like, well, if he takes somebody and they're willing to do the work and he can strengthen those areas and then, you know, make that throw and make use that mechanism. Well, he can make pictures out of anybody. Well, right why can't anybody watch a properly done golf swing mechanism video and go out and have a good golf swing? Why exactly. do they still swing the club with awful trajectory? Why right. is that case? So what do you think the X factor is? Is it, is it like a trust thing to just like really like for me, if when I think about it with a golf swing, yep. if I'm trying to the whole entire time, think through 19 different points, 19 different swing thoughts, um, instead of just letting the swing go and trusting that the work I've done syncs up, I'm forcing the club through the ball. It doesn't create a good result. Right. But when I actually just let it go, like I, I have the foundation you're set up, like you said, Yeah. I, I get to, I have maybe two or three swing thoughts, but from then on, I just need to let myself be an athlete and let the swing go. So that way it can rotate properly. The timing syncs up properly, all the things that you said. So do you see something in the guys that you work with that there's like a congruency of why it clicks for some and why some just constantly fight it? What do you see? Yeah. So, um, there's, there's a lot in there. So Mentally, first and foremost, you have to have somebody that believes in your methodology and what you're doing. So that's first and foremost, right? If you don't believe that I'm actually um, telling the truth or I'm actually going to help you, it's it's not going to matter what I say to you. I'm not going to tell you some magical thing that's going to help you. That makes complete sense. So So that's first and foremost. The second thing would be psychologically, does that person fully believe that they can actually perform those acts? Um, in, in the right timing, in the right sequence. And do they fully believe that they can do it in a pressure filled environment? Mm-hmm. Right. Cause that's like, how the body and the mind sync up. Right. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So like I can, I can nitpick your throw. I can talk about your throw all day, all long. Like I could sit there and play catch with you and have something to say on every throw, but that's going to do you no good. Right. Like you have to, you have to earn your own trust to be able to do that. And on top of that, psychologically, you have to do that in front of thousands upon thousands of fans. Like, are you, are you ready for that? Can you actually do that? So that person has to have a certain level of mentality and willpower about themselves. And then, um, the other, the other kind of layer on top of that would be, um, 
you know, are you are you willing to put in the effort and amount of time that it's going to take to be able to get to that, you know, level that you want to get to, right? That's a that's a whole another whole another ball game as far as um as far as getting a person to actually have that willpower about themselves, mm. right? Most of the guys that come to me, uh, because the approach is like different and so new, is is guys that are on their last legs they're they've done everything they're desperate for change um and they're they're kind of trying to figure it all out for themselves so that's what type of clientele that i I attract now is um almost like a like a last chance you type of type of vibe right Mm -hmm. where it's like Mm -hmm. all right like i've done literally everything else like but now that you've seen some of the guys that you're working with sure get success and yeah get major league contracts yeah is, are you starting to see that change a little bit a little or, bit okay. yeah slowly but just surely. time yeah but it's going to take a little bit more time for that mm-hmm. to actually fully flip on its head mm-hmm. yeah so i actually had the privilege today to finally see your facility and everything yeah. that i see in your videos and it was awesome to see that in fir- in, in, firsthand i've also had the privilege of, of meeting and being around some of the guys that you work for with. sure and you know I'm nerding out to this. I could sit here and listen to you talk about this for the next five hours. Uh, when I was yeah. actually a little kid, baseball was actually my first love. Yeah. I was head over heels in love with the game. My brothers were too. And I would go outside. And at this point in my life, we lived out in the middle of a nowhere on a hundred acres. And there was this little, like, uh, like above ground well spigot, like the kind of like a top crank. It, it just stuck out of the ground, maybe three feet. And okay. it was m- maybe that big around. Yeah. And I would walk out and measure out the pitcher's mound and I would take a bucket of baseballs and I would just stand there and I would throw over and over hitting that spigot. And I was just obsessed. I was obsessed. Yeah. Like, I don't know. I was little leagues. I think before we moved on my life, I threw a one hitter. It was a home run. The guy hit a home run off me, but I threw one hit. I was dude. I just like baseball was everything to me. And then when we moved because of my social anxiety, I was too scared to go join a different team and I never played baseball ever. Really? Never played again. Wow. And actually this is kind of funny and I don't care if like my brother won't care. I share this. Um, him and I used to play each other like every day, all day. I mean, seven hours of us just playing like these little one-on-one games we'd come up with, with like a plastic bat and we'd like tape a wiffle ball, all this different stuff. And there was, when we moved, there was these kids in our neighborhood that was so cool that they had this they had maybe eight kids that they just played every day. And every once in a while I get to go play with them based on what I had going on because I was a little older than them. But there was this one kid specifically that Bryce would play with all the time. And he actually got the opportunity in the Midwest. I don't remember the name of it. Um, I don't want to misspeak by coming up with something I think it is, but he went and tried out for this program and he made it. And it was a travel team and it was for their age group. This other kid that he played with all the time also was a part of that. And it was a big, big deal to get accepted to this. Well, my parents didn't want to adhere to that travel schedule, so they didn't let him do it. Well, this kid did and he stuck with it. But the meantime, Bryce and him are still playing together all the time. Bryce, you know, if you let him tell the story right now, I'd say out of 100, he probably won 99 times and the kid yeah. beat him once. But maybe it was like 90, 10. But bottom line is Bryce won the majority of the time. Yeah, yeah. That kid ended up playing on the Rockies. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And so both of us had that, but we never really like saw what That's could crazy. potentially been there, That's you wild. know, and it's yeah. that is. But so I love I still enjoy this. Yeah. And um I don't want this to go crazy long because there's more there's other things i did want to talk about i, I sure. had in my notes i wanted to talk about just the game of baseball itself right now yeah you know they they, they introduced the pitch clock and trying to speed the game up because the viewership had dropped so yep. much especially then after you know the juice era where all the home runs and everything was so exciting and they would be kind of a kind of a pitcher dominated sport which is great for yep. what you do um and now they're trying to kind of bring that back and it's interesting sean that downstairs was a hitting coach in the major leagues. And so he was telling me, you know, in the last couple of years he was there, how much the system and everything has been changing and what they tried to, like you were, you were saying, you don't want to come at a player and make them change a million different things and get to the right. point where they just like, don't know which way is up because there's just too much going on. Um, and then there were some players, I looked at him and I said, don't you think the honest truth is that 
if a player has already proven himself on the field, then all the hitting coaches, they don't really have as much ground to stand on with them because the player can look at him and be like, yeah, but look what I did. Right. So exactly. you can't try to fix me. I'm already successful, right. you know, right. that type yeah. of thing. And so there's like a really an art to how to understand how someone ticks and then bring changes about that they would actually implement because they trust you like right. you were you were talking about. So what I love about what you're doing is the guys that are trying to get in the league, the guys that have been there before, you're not only showing them drills and, and technique and mechanisms, but you're also really working on their mental approach. And then that's, that's where I want to, what I want to talk about next, For because sure. as I said, I've had the privilege of being around some of the guys that you work with yeah. and I see how much bigger it is than just even baseball, the impact that you're having in their lives. And so I want to ask you a vulnerable question and that's sure. if that's okay. Yeah. Um, I, like I said, I see the impact you're having and I think you'll agree with me. We lead the best leaders lead by example, right? And you know, you hear a lot of quotes that talk about the best leaders are actually those that can bring the best out of others. And I see you doing that. So in order to do that, we have to constantly be bringing the best out of ourselves to lead by example, to be willing to do the hard things we're asking yeah. other people to do. We don't want to be a hypocrite because who's going to trust you, right? There's that trust factor and the experiential factor of what I'm asking you to do, I do myself, right? right? So it's not only not just being a hypocrite, but what you've described, a lot of what you've learned has been through trial and error. For sure. And you've learned through the hard way. And so even uh, about 25 minutes ago, when I said there's something there, I want to bring back, I'm, bring back, I'm thankful I actually just remembered it, is when you bucked the system and said, I'm not going to go through my rehab the way they tell me to, I think I know how to do it better. Maybe at that time, that could have been a little bit foolish then, mm -hmm. but that mentality is now what served you well is end up being a Absolutely. blessing because you've congruently held that mentality, sometimes to your detriment, but sometimes to the point where it caused you to go seek answers that someone was saying, here's the answer. And you're like, no, 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 no. There's, there's more to this answer. There's more, or even a different answer. Right. And I believe that. And I'm going to go find that. And now you've been finding that and you're sharing that with other people. Well, naturally, because your answer looks different than the laminated fancy piece of paper that's been there for decades, right. they're going to be skeptical of what you're presenting them. Right. And so you're leading by example. And now the next step is, is bringing the best out in others. Right. So what are you working on right now in order to be a better leader? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So the thing that I've been working on probably over the past couple months is first and foremost, I have based on being a performance driven person for so, so long, I was a people pleaser mm. and, um, I never wanted to ruffle anybody's feathers. I never wanted to, um, do something, something else, somebody else didn't like because I was fighting so hard for acceptance, right? So my performance was the one and only thing that got me to a point in which um, it got me that acceptance. And so I was at acceptance scarcity almost, right? And so the way that I would kind of avoid not being accepted or rejected, right, would be to, to do you know, anything that anybody ever requested. So like when I first started the program, for instance, um, I was also going to massage therapy school, right? So I was running the program and then I go to school and I was doing that like pretty much six, seven days a week. And, uh, during that time, anybody and everybody who wanted work done on the table, I would do, mm. I would just sit there and it would take hours, hours. Of course. And so, um, and so there were no boundaries. There was no like, Hey, I'm, I'm feeling pretty tired today. I don't really want to do that. <laughs> sure. Um, and so in the past couple months, it's, it's reared its ugly head as far as, um, you know, just being a people pleaser of, mm -hmm. of, Hey, it's okay. I'm going to let this slide or I'm going to let that slide or, you know, whatever. And it got to the point where it was just like, this is just going to create more anxiety Sure. and it's going to rear its ugly head at some certain point. Mm -hmm. And, that's going to not fill up my cup enough where I can now 
like you said, be able to di dig deeper into myself to be able to l ultimately lead, mm -hmm. which is where you need me in the first place, mm -hmm. right? So I can't replenish myself if I keep just people pleasing and, and do doing that cycle because I won't have anything left in my cup right. for you to give. So I can't dig into myself to ultimately give you the motivation that you need to be able to get yourself out of this situation, which is chilling in the backyard with me. That's right. You don't want to be chilling in the backyard That's with me. That's right. That's the last place you want to be. Yes. So um, I, I went and, you know, worked through that to be able to fix that. Mm. Um, so that's ultimately what I've been working on mm -hmm. over the past couple of months to mm -hmm. be able to fix in myself. I love that. We actually have a shirt that we did for Lifted a couple of years ago. And on the back of it, it says, when self-development feels selfish, remember that you have to first be strong so that you can be strong for others. Yep, exactly. And man, am I, like, especially right now, having another baby, two kids under two, owning my own businesses, different life responsibilities. A lot of guys were that dad bod turn, you know, term came into play because mm -hmm. they put everybody else first, which is beautiful, but then they start neglecting taking care of themselves and that ultimately leads to them being out of shape. Right. And um, I, I definitely will acknowledge that there are some circumstances where yes, you could still get it done, but it's very hard to still get that done, yep. you know, especially every day, maybe it's a couple of days and, and I'll like, without going into a whole lecture of now, like the mental approach of at least do it like when you can or two days and all that stuff. I just would acknowledge that it is hard. Mm -hmm. Right. And I'm, I'm seeing that for myself that it's hard right now. And I have a choice to make though. I can still serve them and put them first, but I still need to set the healthy boundaries and it's a little bit different too when it's your kids and your wife, but either even even is people pleasing within your own family, sure. right? And, and setting the right boundaries where I still do need to take care of myself and prioritize my mental and spiritual health and my physical health. So that way I can be the man I need to be to be the father and husband I want right. to be, right? And that's exactly what you're identifying. And I see that very clearly. Um, you and I were talking about this too the other day, and it's gonna be a little bit repetitive because we obviously already had the conversation. Right. Um, but you were talking about identity and now when you're leading by example, you definitely see the importance of leading out of the proper identity, because if they're trying to emulate you and you're still leading out of performance based identity and they're trying to replicate that model where it might serve them for a time, just like it did you, that anxiety or whatever that looks like for them is going to come back off the shelf and yep, haunt them absolutely. too. And so I think that's a part where you and I have a lot of uh, similarities is that we developed mechanisms. You did it earlier than I did. So props, <laughs> but <laughs> also those same mechanisms are things we've had to work to break. For sure but they served us well in different seasons of life that performance mentality it did serve us well at different times until it didn't right and then we had to find okay where does my identity really come from and, and like what you were talking about when you're setting a healthy boundary in place and not people pleasing well what god's teaching us is that when we serve him, it looks like serving others, but the difference between serving others for him is that it doesn't matter what kind of response or what we get in return. If we're serving him, it doesn't matter how, what type of response we get when we're people pleasing. It's because we either don't want them to get angry or we want some type of reciprocated action, or we want to be, you know, patted on the back for what we did and all those things avoid whatever. But when you're serving God, maybe even doing the same action in the same, same scenario, but your motive and your heart posture is different. He's then going to pace us. Cause that's what my simplicity, my, my simplified form of it for myself as I have to always bring it down to as easy as possible is God pace me every day. Pace me, pace me because I want to seek to do your will and I need you to pace me so I don't burn out so that way I can do what you're asking me to right. do. So no longer am I going to get frustrated when a meeting or gets canceled or whatever, right. because if I'm asking you to pace me and then this happens, why am I getting upset for you doing exactly what I ask you to do in the first place? Okay. So we talked about this the other day that, that it clicks for us is that really looking for your purpose 
right? Like God has given you talent in your, your determination, your stick to your, your physical ability, your ability you've articulated extremely well today. So not only do you go and put in the hard work, but there's not a lot of people that then know how to articulate to other people, how to put in the work that they're putting in, right. especially down to the mechanisms and the angle of your arm and all the things like For that's sure. a gift that he's given you. Absolutely. Right. And so it's easy to feel like, okay, this is who God made me to be is I'm a baseball player or I'm a baseball coach or, you know, whatever that box looks like for each person, because you do hear a lot of whether it's pastors or uh, motivational speakers will say, you know, God gave you your gifts, you deploy your gifts, and then you'll find your purpose. Right. And there's a, there's truth in that, but it's missing a really important part that I only recently discovered because that was something I struggle with a lot because I'm like, I'm trying to serve you. I'm trying to put you first. I'm trying to use the talents you've given me. It feels like it's my purpose, but I still feel like a failure. Right. I still like I'm failing all the time. Right. Why is that? And it wasn't until I saw this clip the other day and I shared this with you, but I want to share it with everybody else that it just really landed for me. And this guy is an ultra successful musician and he uses that platform to then share his life story and the love of God and, and, and the things that have changed his life. And he gave this example. He said, people come up to me and say, so you're so blessed that you know your purpose that God gave you. And your purpose is amazing because it serves him. You bring entertainment and you make people feel better. Like that has to feel so great. And he's like, that's not my purpose. I used to think it was my purpose. But if you really think about it, if I got in a car accident, when I leave here today and I can't sing anymore, I can't stand on stage. I don't even have, maybe I don't even have the mental capacity to even remember a lyric or even speak anymore. So what? I don't have purpose anymore. Right. And he said, your purpose is not just using the gifts God has given you. Your purpose is the posture of your heart that yes, he's given you these gifts. Yes. I'm going to step into them and steward them well, because he's given me the, the ability to do so. But it's with the heart that's always in the posture of God. Thank you for giving me the gifts. Thank you for the people and, and the resource and the, and the abilities that you've given me to steward. I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you gratitude the whole time. But no matter what that looks like, whatever arena, whatever gift, whatever person you put in front of me, I'm going to do it unto you. I'm going to love you and I'm going to love my neighbor. Like it doesn't matter then right. what gifts, like you have more than one gift, right? Like your ability to articulate what you do and teach right now could be used completely differently three decades from now to articulate sure. something completely different. Absolutely. And so if we think, oh, well, these are the gifts he gave me and this is my purpose, then you kind of get in that process again of, well, it served me for a time and I didn't feel like a failure, but then now it's not. And did I miss my calling? Did Absolutely. I miss my purpose? Yeah, and I gosh. spent a lot of time. Yep, dude. Me too. I spent so much time. <laughs> Some of it was anxiety driven because like I said, even in my me truck too. that was like, yeah. well, if, if I find my purpose, then it's got to work for sure. And if it doesn't work, it's not my fault. Right. Because you gave me this purpose and it's like, it has to be it. So it has to work and I have to feel good the whole time. It has to come together. And it was almost like an insurance policy for me failing. Right. And then it was like, nope, you got to learn how to just, no matter if you fail, you don't succeed. You're still not a failure. He still is going to love you and be proud of you no matter what. Right. And so that takes some of the pressure off, but then it's still like, but I still want to do, I want to achieve. I'm a progress driven person. Right. Like right. that's why I love in the gym so much is there's not very many areas of life. What you put in, you get back out. Right. Like, to a direct correlation, you know how that works and you right. thrive off of that. Right. But that's not always the case in right. many areas of life. Yep. And so learning how to then be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Yep. That is now my mission. And there's, there's different versions of that. Goggins talks about that a lot, but my version, what I like to do is I like to take the very nitty gritty, intense mental disciplines of someone like a Goggins and then actually bring the foundation of God in it. Right. Like I want to deploy that mentality of I'm seeking being comfortable, being uncomfortable. Comfort is not my goal. I know that if I'm comfortable, I'm not growing. If I'm uncomfortable, then I'm getting to grow. I'm getting to change. I'm getting to learn. And that's something I want to do for the rest of my life. But I can't do it by just relying and trusting in my natural ability to do so in my grit and my mental fortitude and my articulation. Right. And no matter what you want to put in that blank, at some point, it's going to fall short. 
And so the only way that I can actually even accomplish the mission of being comfortable, being uncomfortable is if the, at the foundation of it, it's based on God's strength of him pacing me. Not, not just the foundation, like literally everything. Yeah, everything. Absolutely. I, I, every, every nuance of it. It's almost like, it's almost like God let us run this race where it's like, all right, dude, we're just going to let you run as fast and as far as you can yeah. by yourself, by your own strength, yeah. just to show me like what type of willpower and what kind of heart that you have. Yeah. Then all of a sudden I'm going to change everything in your entire life. We're going to get to this point where you're going to burn yourself out, anxiety, whatever you're going to burn out. Then you're going to have to realize that you have to rely on me. And he's going to break you down. He's going to break, bring you through this process of like, okay, we'll like work together with your willpower and your grit and whatever. And like, we'll work this thing out together and we can kind of sprint together for the time being. And then it gets to the point where it's like, all right, you got to lay everything down. And if you don't, like, you're just going to keep running this hamster wheel of just like over and over and over again of just grit and willpower. Like at some certain point, I feel like God breaks you down and is just like, it is now me over everything and you're no longer allowed to just run on the fuel of your own willpower and brute strength. Mm -hmm. You have to only rely on me and nothing's going to change in your life financially, physically, whatever the case may be mm -hmm. until you lay that guard down and give everything to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that is such a hard lesson for, for guys like you and me to learn because we were so driven and hell bent on doing it our own way. And I think it's so hard for you and I and people like us yes. because of one, that first step that you just identified is really hard. But I think step two is the part that for me and probably for you too, that's really difficult is now mm -hmm. I've relinquished and I expect to see some kind of like result of that. Yep. Like, all right, I let go of the steering wheel. Yep. Now I'm expecting you to take over the steering wheel and drive this thing home or drive it somewhere. And it feels like we're just still, no one's hanging on to the steering wheel. Someone's got to grab that steering wheel. Right. And there's that really uncomfortable period where now he's strengthening your faith. Yep. Like your finances or your business or the health or whatever exactly. has still has not changed. Yes. If it, sometimes it even gets worse. Yep. And then all the people, and that's why I don't want to get worked up and angry right now, but the prosperity gospel preachers that tell people when you find God that your money and everything's going to get better. And then when it doesn't, they're like, well, God must not be real. And this isn't for me. And they walk away from the faith. Right. Like that is not how it works. Right. It's so far from the truth, but has led so many people astray because they bought into that and then it, it didn't pan out. Right. And so that next step of, all right, I relinquished. And Mitch and I talked about this. What we're actually even letting go of is not even actual control. It's an illusion of control. Right. Because you really don't. You don't have any control you don't. whatsoever. Like it's all just an illusion that if I have more money, right. then I can control my life more. And there's part of that that are somewhat true, but then you bring in the fact, well, what if I have a stroke when I go get in my $300,000 car? Right. Or when I go to my job, I can't, all of a sudden I can't tell people I can't teach them. I can't talk anymore. Right. Those are all gifts that we're given on a daily basis that no matter how much we try to control, we can't. No, we can't. Right. And so stepping into that part where it's like, not only do I need to make sure that I'm actually fully relinquishing to you and letting you take over, it's not so that it then produces a certain result in this world. It's right. so that it produces a certain result in me, in right. my heart. Right. Because I might not even be put into a different scenario. Right. My environment or my financial situation or health situation may not change physically. Right. right. But because you changed me, I'm going to see it differently. I'm going to now learn how to have joy, how to have gratitude. Right. Even if I never get to where I thought I needed to go, even if right. things never change, right. you've changed me. So therefore I can handle all of this differently. Right. Is there anything to... Like you, you, we've both, we've said it a couple times that oftentimes what brings us to that point are when things go really bad, you get cut, you don't make it to that next level, your anxiety picks back up and it's like, okay, I need help. But when things are clicking, baby, oh yeah, things are going good. You did right. get called up. You did get that contract. You right. are feeling good. So your anxiety is on the shelf in those right. periods of life. Right. What are you putting into play now for yourself or even teaching the guys that, Hey, when you get to this next step, we got to remain grounded. We got to remain on that foundation that God is everything. What do you do for that? I can't control that. Mm. That's not, that's not something that I can control. That's where, that's where I have to let God take the wheel on that one. Mm. Because like, because when good things happen, 
it almost becomes uh, out of control for some of these guys because they, they have worked so hard. They, they've overcome the the highest odds. Um, you know, like when some of our guys get signed, we're just through the roof. We're ecstatic because, like, you know how hard it is to get signed in professional baseball and get another shot today? It's extremely, extremely difficult mm-hmm. just based on how competitive it is. And so when the guys get signed or re-signed or whatever um, – there's almost like this uh, euphoria, right? And then the euphoria wears off, and it's like, okay, we're actually in the system. We got to pitch our way to the big leagues. We got to do this and that. And that's something that they have to find on their own path. I I can't necessarily you know coach them through that or teach them through that. Mm-hmm. I can always tell them about perspective and, and what perspective I think that they should have. Mm-hmm. But ultimately, like that's something that they got to you know find on their own journey. I believe your opportunity in that is as you keep putting the time in and more and more of these guys yeah. are seeing success because you, which then in turn creates success for your program for and sure. what you do, how you handle it by leading by example, yeah. will then plant that seed. So that way when they get their shot and that starts to pay off for them as it is for you, they see how you're handling it. Right, exactly. And I see, and I see that in you. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah. Um, that's, a, that's a perspective that I've always tried to keep. Yeah. And I almost do it to a detriment to a certain extent where I won't uh, recognize the wins, celebrate. You don't the wins. celebrate. Oh, that's me. Yeah. It's just like, Oh, that's me. It's like, Oh, great. You know, yeah. you got signed. Yeah. Well, guess what? We got training even earlier tomorrow. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Uh, I'm just kidding. But like, no, for real. Like no, I, that's, I, that's how I yeah, think. Like, exactly. it's just like, okay, like <laughs> this too. is really paying off. Yes. And we're going to pay off more is, yeah. is more training, more this, more that. Like, it's just like, that's how I think. Me too. And it's just, um, you know, sometimes it's like, man, like, I just got to take a step back here. Damn. I did that this morning. I was walking out the door and my wife said, Hey, I saw one of your videos. It was something on YouTube because my social traffic has always been mostly on Instagram. Yeah. Yeah. And there was something on YouTube that had picked up a little bit. And she goes, Hey, I saw that, that video. And I go, that doesn't matter until it gets to 10 million. And I walked out the door. <laughs> yeah. I just did it this morning. And yep. I just realized that right yep. when you said that I never celebrate those little wins. I'm getting better about doing it in our personal lives. Right. But anything that has to do with my performance, I still got a long yep. ways to yeah, go. Absolutely. Me I too, got man. a long ways to me go too. on that. So another cool part of the guys, that I've met and got mm-hmm. to be around that you're working with yeah. is I can just something, a, a gift that I've been given is that way I can watch people and read people and even pick up on their energies and stuff. I see and read how they all view you and there's, okay. they all respect you. Yeah. They all, there's, they all like you. Um, and not because of a people, people pleasing thing, but because of who you are, I yeah. think a lot of people, which is really cool right now, are getting the, an opportunity to see genuinely who Cam is. And that's right. who I saw you after <laughs> when I met you, you're the real deal. That. I've Thank told you, you that from the very beginning, dude, yeah. even when like I first met you and you weren't even saying much, right. I still could just say, like, I've told everybody, I love that dude. Yeah. What you see is what you get. Yeah. He's not running game. He's not trying to fool you. Right. He's not trying to put on a persona. Right. Like he's rock solid. Yeah. And I would much, much rather be around somebody that might even be quiet, but is rock solid and what I see is what I get than somebody that's super loud and articulate and ta- talented and running game. And you don't really know who that person is. Right. You're the type of person I want to roll with. And cool. I see those guys see you that way. Yeah. And then now, even as you continue to grow and even develop, they're watching and seeing that. And I think that's inspiring them in a way that not only is going to help them in their baseball career, but in their personal lives, especially and right. in their relationships and in their walk with God and everything. Right. So that leads me to, I have two questions left. One being, yeah, yeah. what do you think is legacy? What do you qualify as legacy? What does legacy mean to you? And what do you want your legacy to be? Wow. <laughs> yeah, just two small questions. That's actually, that was actually one. The next, <laughs> next question's coming. So I, when I said that, I actually, in my mind, said, you just said two, and you just yeah, said, yeah. you just ripped off three. But No, yeah, no, yeah you're, no you're fine. Um, as, far as, as far as legacy goes, um, you know, it, it'd be great to be known as, as this great baseball trainer. That'd be fantastic. But really and truly, we all know that the game's going to fade away from us at some certain point, at some certain level, right? Um, and so what I want to be, what I want to be known for is a guy that, that helped guys set up their lives, right? Like really and truly like set up their lives, um, in, in every single aspect. And so like, yeah, like the training is, is cool and, and everybody loves the training, but really and truly to show up six days a week at a certain time, every single day at a certain hour really just shows you like what the responsibility of life is going to be like in the future. You're really just training for that, right? Mm -hmm. Like 
one day you're going to have a wife and kids and you're going to be woken up at a time that you don't want to go to. And it doesn't matter what you did the night before. Your kid's still going to be hungry, still going to be sitting on the couch yep. ready. Like, where's my food, dad? Right. Yep. Like, you know that all too well. Right. <laughs> That's one of the things that we need to get prepared for. And there's a lot of um, just in just in our generation, just people not committing to something that's like that right mm -hmm. and so that that'd be one of the legacies that i want to leave behind is you're getting ready for for your life regardless of if you make it to the major leagues or not you're, you're gonna know how to live life going forward i love that right and so that's legacy you know number one um and what was the other question i so i, I asked you it was basically the same question yeah and that's why technically i sort of did maintain okay. to the two questions because the next one's coming all right but i broke it up so yeah. what i said was what how do you define legacy and what do you right. want your legacy to be so you just answered that question okay basically. gotcha yeah, yeah. Make sure. i i think that the what you tied in 10 minutes ago about eliminating the people pleasing side yes because if you were trying to do exactly what you just said, but because you wanted those people to remember you that way, you'd still be slightly off in your compass. But because sure. now you're ripping that out of it yeah. and completely eliminating that and saying, I don't care about pleasing them. I care about loving them well and doing what's best for them. Right. So that might even be tough love, tough conversations, maybe even kick them out of your program yep, at some sometimes. point. And that's yep. hard, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to the money too that attaches yeah. to it. But that shows where your actual true allegiance is. I say this a lot of times. I really believe in being a loyal person, but my loyalty has to be to God and the truth. And if you're loyal to God and the truth, then we're going to look over and we're going to be looking at each other shoulder to shoulder. Right. It can't even be just to one person. We say, well, what about even like your spouse? No, because then I'm people pleasing again. Yep. If I'm loyal to my spouse and they're doing something that's completely terrible for them and I'm not strong enough to love them enough to look at them and say, Hey, this is wrong. Right. I'm not doing them any good. No, you're not. So if my loyalty remains and anchored in God and the truth, then at all times I'm going to love them well. Right. And so that's what you're doing now in these men's life by leading by example, but also having the hard conversations and telling them these things is now that legacy is being created, but it's not because you want them to look back and say, Oh, Cam was the man. I really liked him. He was such a nice guy and he did right. my life this way. You're like, no, I want to see their life. I want to see that ripple effect take place. Even if I don't get the credit for it. Right. That's totally fine. And you're spot it. on. Absolutely. I love it, dude. 100%. I love it. All right. Now my last question. Yeah, let's do it. This is a tricky one. Okay. Simple, but it'll make you think on the okay. spot. Okay. Let's do it. Billboard right here at Scottsdale on the 101. Okay. Or if you want to pick, let's go 101 and the 202 closer to your neck of the okay. woods where let's it's the it. highest traffic. Okay. Yeah. You get to have a saying on there, just a phrase or even a picture, whatever you want on the billboard, but then your name is signed below it. Yep. What's on that billboard? Strive for excellence at all times. Yeah, I've, I've thought about. I've thought about. Um, you sure you don't want to think about that? For yeah, a no, no, no. I, I, no, I, I I've, my I've, man. I've been wanting to get that tatted on my body for a while. I don't know if I'll actually pull the trigger on that. Let's but, do it. Um, I got yeah. my next appointment coming up. With my buddy, you come with me. He'll, <laughs> he'll throw that on there in five seconds. That's what we'll made that happen. That'd okay. be sick. I got you. Um, no, strive for excellence at all times. And so this is this is a difficult one for me sometimes because, again, my perspective might be off, right? Because <clears throat> strive for excellence at all times could be performance based right and so it could be like okay i gotta hit xyz number in the gym and or I, I gotta throw this hard or i gotta get this many people signed or whatever but it's really and truly just walking in a in a spirit of excellence in whatever aspect that i'm doing right this goes this goes so much further than just you know my business it goes into my personal life right like am i am i connecting well with everybody in my family uh, I mean, sometimes yes, sometimes no, right? <laughs> like there's an area that could be worked on there, right? Sure. There's always work to be done. Always. Unfortunately, like we're, we're, as men, we're cursed f that we're going to have never ending work. <laughs> never ending work doesn't mean that it's physical labor all mm. the time, right? Mm. Like we have to toil every single aspect of our lives, mm. right? And so that might come to, you know, making sure that my relationship's right with my parents. Um, you know, making sure that I'm, you know, taking care of myself uh, just on a personal level of being like, OK, am I the best version of myself so that I can pour into other people? Is my cup filled up enough where I can pour into what they're doing and motivate them the way that I was designed to? Right. So strive for excellence at all times goes so much deeper than just, you know, how fast I can throw a baseball, how many guys I can get signed how much money I can make in a program, you know, what I can sell, whatever. Right. So 
strive for excellence at all times has definitely been my motto for that motto time. is that okay how long ago did you come up with that that's probably been since uh 2023 like it right in the summer um yeah did it mean something then though differently than what you just oh 100 okay yeah, yeah so yeah. when i when i first came up with it it was like okay so if i can make somebody throw 95 98 uh within like two three months um that's that's what i'm after that's what strive for excellence at all times means how many guys can i get to 95 or better and how many guys can i get signed how many training uh sessions do i need to do to be able to do that and get them there and all that stuff right how many new exercises do i need to come up with what new product line can i come up with um that was strive for excellence at all times because it was purely based on business it was purely based on just heart hustle and grind so um that has definitely changed that perspective of it um you know over time as i've kind of you know learned to think about things just a little bit differently in business and also in my personal life that's so cool how even that motto in itself that the world a, a group of a million people whatever you want to call it could look at that and say okay there's something noble there's there that's a, that's a really great saying yeah but then you took something like that you unpacked it and yeah. then you did exactly what i said earlier you put god as the foundation and made for it sure. everything about that yeah like for me i i try to make my goal i say i want to put a smile on god's face okay and then again that sounds performance driven yeah i gotta obey i can't sin i can't mess up but that's what gives me the ability to sit in the grace and know that even if I do go sin, even though I do mess up, he still looks at me and has that smile on his face because he loves me. I'm right. his son. Right. And that gives me the ability to like step into that freedom that is free and available to everybody. But so many of us right. don't feel worthy of it. Right. And we're not. We're not. That's why it's yeah. grace. Right. That's why it's grace. Right. <laughs> Thank you for doing this with me. Absolutely. Dude, I just want to tell you just in what I've watched over the last year, it's been so amazing to watch. Appreciate like, that the way that you are taking your self-discipline, even that performance mentality, and you're allowing, allowing God to heal it and change it into driving you in order to stand in the difficult gap, to be the man in these guys' lives and the other people's lives in your life, where it's gonna be your wife or your kids or anybody that comes across your path, right. that when they're around you, they're like, there's something different about that guy. And it's not because you're yelling at them and trying to convince them. Right. They just watch you and they sense it, they feel it. And they're like, what is that? And then now you have an opportunity when they ask. And I feel like there's going to be a lot of opportunities for you to answer that question because of how you carry yourself, man. I see that in you. I believe Absolutely. in you. And I'm thankful that you did this with me today. Appreciate so. that, man. Thanks for having me. Well, that's another episode, Living Lifted. That was... Uh, that was fun. And honestly, man, I don't want to knock anybody else's answer on, a, on the billboard thing, but you hit that right <laughs> on the head and you hit it really quick too. So that yes, I think sir. so far you're in first place, Mr. Awesome. Performance. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> We're going to put you at the top of the list. All right. We'll see you guys in the next episode.